Uh, hello, everybody. Good morning. Uh, I'm David Baines. I'm the COO of IP Group, and I'm just here to introduce you to our uh, annual programme to celebrate IP Group's 20th year. We're calling it our 20 in 21 Innovation Generation Series. And what we're planning on doing is we're going to look back, just as we've just done, and see the first 20 years of IP Group, understand some of the key moments, but also understand more about the different components of our company. And there'll be different webinars throughout the year talking about all the different aspects of our business. But also towards the end of the year, we're planning on looking forward and then be looking forward to the next 20 years of innovation generation to get a good idea of the sort of things we hope are going to happen in the next 20 years as well. We're going to start today with IP. Now, this seems a good idea for three different reasons, really. First of all, IP is so important to us, it's actually in our name. We are IP Group. Secondly, because IP Group has always been built upon a, a fairly unusual model. Not many people go back, not just to the very early stage of investment, but actually getting involved before companies even exist. And IP Group throughout its history has been happy to go right back to research institutes and universities and identify some core IP that might be an interesting idea to build a business around. And then we've had super patient capital approach where we've stayed with those companies all the way through, often all the way through to IPO and beyond, some of our companies we've been with for 20 years, right from the very beginning. And, and last, but rather neatly, because today is World IP Day, uh, and this year's theme is specifically about shining a light on the critical role of SMEs in the economy and how IP is actually crucial to building stronger, better, more competitive economies. So it all rather neatly combines in a single day. And I'm also delighted to introduce uh, the host for today, Jeremy Holmes, who is our in-house IP expert. Um, we're very proud of Jeremy. Uh, he's been named um, uh, an IP star in managing intellectual properties corporate IP stars list for the last five years in a row. Uh, he's also um, a top IP stra strategist, I think, in the IMA 300, top 300 IP professionals. So the form for today is Jeremy will be presenting in a minute, then there's a round table, he'll talk through it. But if at any stage you have any questions you'd like to ask, there's the chat function and you'll be able to ask questions, and I'm sure Jeremy will take you all for it. So without further ado, Jeremy, I'll hand over to you. DB, thank you very much for that very fulsome um, introduction there. I had my camera switch off deliberately to stop myself blushing at the compliments that were passed to me. Um, good morning, everybody, and a very, very happy World IP Day. This is a very auspicious day, as um, DB has just pointed out there. This has been instituted by the World Institute for Intellectual Property Office um, to celebrate the, the date in 1970, I think it was, when they were actually formed and the, the whole PCT Pact Cooperation Treaty and all the other um, laws that were brought into effect put them into, into actually into existence. And so they've been a dominant and predominant force in the protection of intellectual property worldwide ever since. And for the last 10 years, they've decided to commemorate, to celebrate this day by having a particular theme. And what better theme could they have chosen this year than the importance of, of IP to SMEs or to spin outs or to small companies, call them what you will. There's a very illuminative introduction to, to this all on the WIPO website today um, by the, the WIPO um, COO, Darren Tang, talking about how recent um, financial surveys have shown that something like 90% um, of the uh, world's economy and 70% of the employment is predicted to be coming from SMEs. And clearly, they all need to be doing something to make sure that they compete effectively in the marketplace and protect what it is they do. So this is you know, clearly a very important um, thing for us to consider, particularly in light of the world economy and the challenges it has been facing, especially over the last year to 18 months, as we all are, I think, too, too painfully aware. So what a great day and what a great theme that we've got. And particularly um, the, the, the last and great coincidence as well is, is for IP Group celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. And IP Group, as DB said, invested IP rich high tech companies, which are in basically embracing and growing and developing and commercializing world changing, world beating technologies, be that in, in the technology, clean tech or life sciences areas. And we will be looking into some of that later on in the presentation. So what I want us to do today is to look at some of the challenges that people working within SMEs do face um, in terms of protecting and actually quantifying their IP. Um, it is a bit of a roller coaster ride, as we, if we look on the first slide here, the presentation here, 
uh, the second slide, sorry, on, on that one to see, that this is really very much a roller coaster ride of um, business development, picking up the funding, keeping going with the technology, and all the time casting an eye over your shoulder to, to how you protect your IP. So what we're going to do today, I have a few words of my, my, own, my own experience over 10 years working in this space of commercialization of um, IP coming out of universities and small medium-sized companies. Um, but then we'll draw on a very expert panel that we have, um, people from the investment side, from the UK Intellectual Property Office, and also from two of our portfolio companies, giving their own opinions on what all this is. But the key thing to look at is this virtuous cycle on the right-hand side here of having the bright idea, and I couldn't resist having a slide about IP without having a picture of a light bulb in it, developing that into a golden asset, and then business development, and then continuously processing that to keep on developing more ideas, increasing your assets and increasing your business. But the thing that's lying behind all this is being able to be IP savvy because this, this whole process is going to be a bumpy one. Finance doesn't come through in nice monthly installments like some people's paychecks too. You have to go out and actually ask for it in funding rounds and know when you're going to do that and then face the questions that you get during those funding rounds. So keeping a tight handle on the IP is going to be a continuous process that's going to demand not just money, but time. So moving on to the next slide, what are the challenges that you're going to face? Well, the key one really is, and this, this seems like a little bit of a no brainer, but it really is knowing what your IP is. And this is idea of doing, performing an IP audit to work out what is it that we have that is protectable Intellectual property is all about being able to protect your ideas, your technology, reinforce your place in the competitive marketplace and keep everybody else at bay. It's what's known as monopoly right for that reason. Um, but it has to protect what you're doing. So it has to be aligned to your business plan as well. So these are two very, very important challenges here. So it's knowing what it is. Far too often I hear people say, well, um, either we have some patents or we don't. And that's the extent of their IP audit. And I think really you need to dig and delve much more deeply into this whole process. IP is not just about patents. IP is about various other registered rights, such as trademarks and designs, but also about some other rights that sit underneath, such as know-how, trade secrets, and copyright, which all interweave underneath the whole raft of registered IP rights to give you a very, very comprehensive protection to what it is that you're doing and creating within your business. It's going to be crucial for you to know about this so you can see where the money needs spending in terms of protecting your IP or documenting the IP, and also where you need to provide time for that. This has to be part of a business plan when you're going to investors to ask for money to come into, say, not just what we've got, but what we're going to do to keep that protection going forward. So this needs to be built in very clearly from the outset. And it's not just a one off thing that you do. So you don't just do it right at the beginning and then leave it all. You've got to keep on going with this and have a proper strategy in place. So when it comes to actually knowing what your IP and what IP pipeline you've got, you need to have processes and documentation procedures in place for recording the new ideas, the new know-how, the new trade secrets, to have all that so it is there and can be seen and perceived by anybody else coming to actually review your assets. IP is a key asset as much as anything else, the bricks and mortar and the machinery and the products you're making. It may be intangible in some ways, but it's very tangible in terms of the, the revenue it can actually produce for you. So it's very crucial for you to have this properly database, to have this properly documented and know exactly what it is you've got. And at particular stages in the this roller coaster of a funding round, um, to have this all there in what we call a due diligence process. So it's all there set up and ready, and there's not a sudden scurry of activity to, to do that. So what are the solutions to this? Moving on to the next slide. Well, it's not just a question of knowing your IP, it's understanding it so you can explain it to others. Now, I know that at least one member of the panel on Juju Slater is like myself, a fan of the TV series Dragon's Den. Um, and there's a little anecdote I quite often tell at this point, which was, in fact, reinforced by the, the most recent episode of the most recent series of that, where it's knowing your IP and explaining to others so that they know you have the, the right IP. So to paraphrase Alec Guinness on Star Wars, 
you don't have somebody turning around saying this is not the IP we were looking for, as they did to one of the poor punters um, on the last episode where he had protected his latest design for a um, fitness apparatus and asked what it got. He said, oh, I've got a patent. And in fact, it turned out he had what's known as a design patent, which is what we in the trade here in the UK refer to as a registered design. And all of a sudden, the, the spark and the light in the eyes of the investors went out because that to, to them was not what they were looking for or thought they'd got. So be able to explain this to, to everybody else thoroughly, clearly, concisely. What people don't want to hear is, yes, I have a patent and it's all about sentences which start with the words of the claims of my granted patent cover, et cetera, et cetera, will be much more music to the ears of investors from that point of view. So this is going to be a little bit of hard work for everybody to really get their heads around what seemed to be quite an arcane, complicated and very expensive process. That normally you just leave to the patent attorneys. But believe you me, the more that you can start talking the same language, the more impressive you're going to be um, to your potential investors. And it's not just about what the piece of IP is, it's about the process that you go through to get that IP as well. So understand each of the particular stages of that process, even if not in minute detail, so you know what the key milestones of it are. Two reasons for this. One, so that you will understand how to build it into any budgeting and financial plans that you're making for your business. But secondly, so again, with confidence, you can talk to investors and tell them what stage your IP is at and reassure them that there are minimal risks involved. Investors sometimes do tend to look at, for example, as a granted patent, something that is safe and stable and a patent application as something that is still carrying a certain element of, of risk to it. So the more you can do to reassure them of the stages that what's happening, the better it will be. Now, I swear in this process by the two T's. Anybody that's had the uh, misfortune to work for me as, a, as an internal trainee will know on this one. That I swear by tables and timelines all the time on that. One. So have a nice, neat, concise table listing your, your IP and titles and dates within that. And hopefully a, an extract of the um, technology itself and a printout of one of the main claims there. Very clear, that is then your introduction to all the detail that you might put in a data room, for example, for a due diligence process. If you are building up a considerable portfolio of IP, then something else that will be very important is to show somebody how this has progressed over time and where it's going to. And a very, very simple timeline of that whole process will actually visually speak for a thousand words on that one, trying to explain why all these pieces of IP have come in there. We saw a marvelous timeline in that introductory video for how IP group has developed, when the same way an IP portfolio can develop as well. And it shows how clearly planned it was. And sometimes your technology, the business itself takes a slightly different direction. And you can actually explain against the timeline of how that has happened. Lastly, but no means least on this one, is to have the best people to help you. Almost inevitably, the, the IP protection will be outsourced to, to professionals with, within the private practice attorney firms, many of whom I, I'm sure, I certainly hope, are, are on the line listening today. And that partnership has to be worked out to, to, to work to its best. So you need to have people there that want to engage with you as part of a business team so that encourage your external patent attorneys to feel that they are part of the whole business team. Bring them into many more brainstorming and research meetings so they can see the developing IP going through there. Reassure yourselves that at each stage of the game, they really get the technology as well as you do and excited about technology as well as you are too. And that way you'll have the best partnership there. So moving on from there to some more of the, the details here. Well, some of the, the things that come out of your, your IP audits, and again, I know this, this may well be touched on by, by at least one of my, my panel here talking on, on um, the hidden aspects of IP, if you like, but know-how and trade secrets. These terms are banded around, sometimes interchanged, but they're not quite the same thing. Um, one tends to develop from the other, I suppose, is the best way of putting it, but see this as a clever store cupboard of, of spices that you can blend in with patents and other rights. It's really the, the hidden tricks and tips to, to the favourite family recipe for Christmas cake or the, the software that's sitting, the algorithms that's sitting behind the whole process by which um, a new medical device or a new app on a mobile phone might be working. And these are all the things that actually it's best 
not to tell the whole general public about it, but keep secret because you hope even when your product is being sold, nobody can work it out. But as you build this up, and some companies will be, their IP will almost totally consist of this, but that still has to be documented, still has to be put in place. So you can't just go around to investors and say, I have tons of know-how, please give me lots of money. It's a question of actually saying what that know-how addresses, what particular aspects of the business it does and what it is you have. So it's under a suitable confidentiality agreement or so forth, you could then show that and demonstrate that to somebody. What is also very important is to, as your business develops, to do, stick your head further and further above the parapet to see what your competitors are doing. Not just so that you can actually price yourself against them or know who to actually compete with in terms of sales, but also to show how you're distinguishing yourselves against them. What your USP is um, from the point of view of your IP. Um, many people will, will know on this call that the intellectual property you gain has to be not just new, but a certain um, bar of what we know as, as cleverness or inventive step or non-obviousness attached to it. And so knowing what your competitors are doing will enable you to turn around and say, well, look, they've not thought of this, they've not managed to solve this problem, here's why we get our IP, and here's where it gets its strength from. But also, and very importantly, as business develops, have they got some IP that could actually be some kind of roadblock for yourself, or some kind of um, impediment to you actually push on with your business. And this is what's known in the trade as FTA or freedom to operate. And increasingly, you'll, you'll need to actually be very, very aware of that. It's sort of like sort of trying to drive drive through um, some, somewhere on a, on a holiday, which, which probably most of us are actually imagining these days, not actually being able to do, without looking at the do not enter, do not come in here, private property signs, and just ignore and think, well, that doesn't quite apply to me. In the same way, other people's IP is a kind of private property defence to what they're doing. And you really need to be aware of this and the risks attached to it. And the more your business goes on, the more you need to do that. Um, and this will all create a huge amount of work to be done in-house. So you need to think early on about how is it you're managing your IP? And this can be down to the actual nuts and bolts and logistics of uh, doing the management in terms of do you need a, a software documentation system in place so that you can monitor what's going on and look at deadlines that might be needed to attend to or forms that might need to be signed, fees that need to be paid. Um, in terms of the correspondence coming in from your patent attorneys, how is that picked up and dealt with on a daily basis? You might want, for example, to have a, a dedicated email address that is patents at mycompany.com. Um, but it's really about not being pushed in this, but pulling that whole process. So driving the car, don't be a passenger. So as soon as you can, try and have some kind of dedicated time to the management of the IP, either from yourself as, as one of the leadership team or somebody whose role it is. And it might only be on a half day, one day a week, but they can pick that role up and deal with all the um, time consuming communications that there are. This will also be much improved, as I said earlier on, about bringing your attorneys in and making them part of the whole process too. And finally, on my last slide here, I sort of rather dramatically entitled this, um, what can go wrong? Well, maybe what can go wrong is a little bit of a, as I say, an over-dramatization here, but here are sort of some little things that from my point of view, I would always be wanting to, to keep an eye out for um, as, as you're going through. This whole roller coaster ride of bringing in your financing, the, the Series A, Series B, the various funding rounds, each of these requires what's known as due diligence process. Basically, it's, it, it's, it's sticking you, almost sticking your dirty laundry out on the line, so to speak. So you have to pull everything together and put it in, in a data room. So don't wait until the last minute to get all the issues sorted and all the information collated. Have your tables, have your timelines have all the other information there ready that you can put into a data room and if for example there had been an issue on a previous funding round from something and then funders have said well okay well we want this sorted out by the next one make sure it is done by then otherwise they're going to be deeply disappointed that you're not at least looked at some things and then there might be things to do with with the ip where they wanted um a bit more rationalization about what you've got maybe a little bit more clear-cut picture of what it is you have in your know-how or there might be issues over, over ownership as well too to look at there um, so issues about ownership of the ip control of the ip um, what you're doing with other people. These are all things that are going to be very important to, to play here. You might be still um, under control of IP that you've 
um, inherited, so to speak, from uh, one or other university technology transfer departments. And there might be issues over whether you want to take control of that, whether you have sufficient control or not, or whether it's actually relevant to what you're doing. Some collaborative programs you've entered into, there might be arising IP issues, and also contracts and licenses are going to be very important to understand. So here's some more documents you're going to need to read through and understand that process as well. Um, and lastly, but not least, I think this might again be touched on by the panel. You might want to think at this point, and I say maybe at this later point rather than earlier one, because there is expense involved, of whether you want to take on IP insurance, because this will then show investors that you're taking it very seriously in case there are unknown of risks in terms of litigation risks from third parties against you, or for you, most importantly, to be able to assert all this highly expensive and highly time consuming IP against somebody else to actually stake out your competitive position. So those are really just a few words from, from me, from my experience on this. I hope all this is um, stirring up a few thoughts and questions from you as DB said, sort of fire those in. But very importantly now, I would like to welcome, I'm very, very pleased to be able to welcome four panelists here who are joining us today for this. And I'm very grateful to them all for giving up their time here. So. Um, in particular order, I'd like to introduce, first of all, Guy Robinson from the UK Intellectual Property Office, who is the Divisional Director there responsible for Innovation Policy Management Information and Business Intelligence in the Innovations Directorate. Thank you, Guy. Cassie Doherty from Parkwalk Advisors, who's a Life Sciences Investment Director and has received numerous plaudits as, uh, for her uh, role in, in the investment field and known to us at IP Group as a colleague too. And from two of our key portfolio companies. First of all, Tim von Werner from a relatively new portfolio company rising from Imperial College, RSC Power. Tim is the CEO of that company. And last by no means least, Martin Yagi from First Light Fusion, which this year celebrated its 10th anniversary, pleased to know. Um, there, and Martin is the intellectual property manager there. So first of all, thank you to you all for, for joining us. So Guy, if I could turn to, to you first. Um, Understanding managing your IP to the best effect is, as I said, it's, it's crucial for the IP rich firms that we've been talking about and who will be attending today. And obviously the IPO plays a vital role in providing support and guidance to these businesses. And maybe you could outline a little bit what the IPO offers that will make a difference to, to today's audience. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Jeremy. And thank you for inviting me to come along today. Um, a real privilege to come along and um, and sort of uh, and be involved um, and and thank you, Jeremy. I think some some brilliant practical knowledge there, and we are very keen that people sort of um, use and utilise and uh, their intellectual property, and it's not just considered a sort of technical and and legal issue. Um, your stats at the beginning kind of uh, interested me because I was reading something uh, the other day, and it wasn't a, a piece of our own um, research or, or a publication, but uh, I'll confess it, it's. Um, someone else with a vested interest, it was the EPO and the EUIPO found that um, in the UK, IP right intensive industries accounted for um, something like one in three jobs uh, and over 40% of GDP, 15% um, uh, of, of total UK employment and over 50% of exported goods. Um, and, and some of our own research says that um, use of IP has been linked with uh, an increase in firm performance and ownerships of, ownership of IPR strongly associates with improved economic uh, performance at a firm level. Now, I, I won't go into causality or anything else because I think it's probably questionable. What, what I think it does say is if you, if you get your IP, you probably get some of the other things that make your business work as well. Um, as, uh, to your question, uh, sort of, uh, what is the IPO up to basically? I think it's probably three parts. And, uh, I think first and foremost, um, we, the Intellectual Property Office, uh, we're the government agency responsible for the IP system here in the UK. And so that's the granting of rights and the development of um, uh, legislation and policy. Um, and we, we, you know, basically we strive to develop an effective and balanced regime, uh, which encourages and supports innovation. And, um, and actually we, we seem to be getting uh, some of that right. The UK um, IP system is, is consistently rated as one of the best in the world. Um, to, to sort of a more practical measure, that sort of business support piece, um, we offer a, a load of uh, SME resources, um, details for which most can be found on um, our 
uh, IP for business uh, web pages. Um, they, they start with more basic introductions such as um, IP equip, uh, helps users understand the four main IPRs, so intellectual property rights. Um, and then there's things like our IP health check, uh, which is a diagnostic tool um, at the end of which we'll give some recommendations, some actions, and, and some of which you've touched on things like, you know, making sure you're engaging with an attorney as a, as a partner rather than just sort of saying, can you, can you do X for me? Um, I think possibly more relevant for our audience today, um, there's tools like our IP for investment, um, which can be used to help IP rich businesses seeking growth finance uh, to develop uh, investor readiness. Um, and there's things like our IP audit scheme, which are part funded audits uh, for high growth or potential high growth businesses, um, which are, uh, we deliver those through, uh, through a particular um, business support programs such as um, Innovate uh, Edge. Um, of course, like many were before before COVID, we did loads of sort of face to face events, um, but most of that has now moved uh, to online webinars such as this. And actually, it means that I think probably more people can attend and, and, and we get probably a richer conversation as a result. Um, we also do a lot of work in the regions, um, uh, so, so uh, business and IP centres and also growth hubs. Um, and so, I mean, that is basically so that we can't be at the point of trying to talk to people um, uh, when we're needed. And, uh, and so we're trying to make sure we do that through others. Uh, we've got an IP masterclass that um, we train many of them uh, through, but that's actually a commercial entity, so others can as well. Things like universities, knowledge exchange, we have the Lambert toolkit collaboration agreements and um, and uh, and work with researchers to train researchers so they understand intellectual property. Um, I think these these tools and interventions are, are broadly around the sort of the themes of, um, uh, you know, identify, protect and exploit. But your, mm -hmm. your point about um, kind of remembering that this is this isn't static, you need to keep yes. on and you need to keep your and your competitors' IP under review to ensure that it's uh, is really properly considered. Um, just quickly on the on the future, you know, obviously operating in a in a innovation ecosystem, we can't stand still ourselves, and so we're embarking on a transformation program. Uh, we we want to become uh, more effective, not just more efficient. Um, and so that we hope in, in due course will allow people, such as researchers, to be able to better access things like our um, our data. Um, and finally, just to emphasize, I think um, we're keen to develop our policy and services uh, in light of uh, customers, so, so people like uh, on, the, on, on the webinar today. And so we hold consultations and um, uh, on significant sort of legislative uh, policy changes and regularly hold things like roundtable discussions when we're developing strategies. Um, uh, and I think it's fair to say we've got really excellent relations with trade bodies and professionals, but we could we would really welcome more engagement directly with SMEs and appreciating that our audience are all busy people. But thoughts on how we might go about doing that would be really gratefully appreciated. Thank you. I think I've rambled on enough there. Thank you. No, not at all, Guy. I, mean, I think it, it's, it's a measure of um, one, thing, one thing I wanted everybody, I was so delighted you could join us, is, is to make everybody participate in the call aware of, of how much the UK IPO is doing. And, and we we, you know, we should be very, very aware of not, not just the existence of you guys, um, tucked away in that beautiful corner of Newport, but also um, you know, the, all, all the hard work and the, the efforts you're you know, making to bring everybody together and realise how important the, these SMEs are part of the economy. And I would strongly encourage everybody, just as you've done, to, you know, to reach out, pick up the phone, set up a Zoom call, set up a Teams call with, with you and your colleagues there to see to see what's going on. And um, you know, if you don't ask, you don't find out in a sense, but also explore the myriad of possibilities that are on the website. So I'd like to sort of park that just for a little while and now turn and get the perspective really from a couple of our portfolio companies of how they've been finding the challenges. And first of all, I'd like to turn to um, Tim Von Werner from RSC Power. That's that's okay there, Tim. So Tim, welcome, welcome aboard as well. So um, I know you'll tell us a little bit more about your company, but you're at a pretty early stage of development and operating in, you know, in a market that's changing rapidly. So what have for you been the key challenges around IP up to this point? Is it time? Is it money, process, or is it all three? Good morning, Jeremy. Thanks for the invitation to, to participate. This, as, as you mentioned at um, the beginning of the introduction, RFC Power is a spin-out from Imperial College London. We're developing the low cost, long duration energy storage solution that will support the transition to a zero carbon energy system. 
We were founded on IP, originally invented at the college, and now we're building upon that foundation as we expand and strengthen our IP portfolio. Our core flow battery chemistry is protected by a series of patents, several of which have now been granted in multiple territories. This patent protection for a low cost chemistry gives us a competitive advantage in a market that's growing rapidly and forecast to grow even faster as the deployment of renewable energy picks up pace. So for your question, the key challenge for us at RFC has been really trying to strike the right balance between managing the costs associated with patents and maximizing the protection we can obtain. Obviously, as, as a startup, we have a, a, a limited budget <laughs> in terms of what we can spend on, on, on patents. And you know, this, this balance really requires a detailed analysis of, of the industry that you're working in. Where are the main markets likely to be? Where is the competition based? Where will production be based? Is this sort of a nationally segmented market with lots of small local players? Or is it likely to be a global market with fewer businesses, larger, uh, uh, larger players? Answering these questions uh, really help to define the, the IP strategy that's right for, for your business and, and really should be a key feature of your business plan. Um, realistically, you also need to be thinking about the long term when making these decisions. Saving a little money up front can uh, potentially end up costing you quite a bit in, in lost revenue in, in, in the long run. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. That, that, that's great. And I think uh, what I'd like to do now is just get a feel for, for the contrast there of the, you know, the, the challenges and some very good issues there. You're saying of, you know, don't, don't be afraid to spend the money earlier on because you know, by the time you realise it's time to spend the money, it's probably too late to spend it, um, point of view. And, and also sort of you know, the, the difficulties you, you have of looking, anybody has in this, this area of looking at which, you know, which territory is protecting, where is the main competition going to come from? And sadly, um, SMEs, and the same way as patent attorneys are not equipped with, with a crystal ball to look into the future on that one. It's a bit of a best guess there. But I'd like to contrast that, I think, with um, a company that's sort of fur much further down the road, but facing its own sort of set of challenges. So to turn to Martin here. So um, contrasting now, you're, you're, you're a medium, what I call maybe a medium mature company of 10 years old this year. And so very happy to sort of raise the flag for another anniversary for you guys there as well. Yeah, would you be able to contrast the challenges you're facing with those um, from Tim there. Again, is it around identifying the IP? Is it the IP you don't know you have? Um, and maybe a little bit on know-how and trade secrets. Yeah, sure. And thanks, I should say, to Jeremy and IP Group for inviting me to this first. Um, and you're right, uh, First Light has just celebrated 10 years in 21. So that complements very nicely with IP groups 20 and 21. So I guess I should set the context a little bit first. So I'm the IP manager here at First Light Fusion. It's an Oxford University spin out. It's looking to solve uh, fusion power generation using the simplest machine possible. Um, First Light is now just over 50 employees. And I joined from the team, uh, the IP team at Vodafone. And that definitely can't be considered an SME anymore. That was a long time ago since that was an SME. Um, so here I handle all aspects of all types of IP, so trademarks, patents, trade secrets, contract confidentiality clauses, open source licensing, um, and I also occasionally tighten a bolt or two when there's a need for, a, for all hands on deck activity uh, to get the technical uh, work moving along as well, or, or pretty much anything that's needed for the company really. Um, and I think that's pretty typical for an SME, everyone gets involved. Um, so here we've had a dedicated IP person for about three and a half years now, and it's been me for the last three. And when I joined, there were only 30 people working here, and almost all of them were technical people. Uh, and actually, even now, we're still dominated by technical staff, since we're still in that pre-revenue R&D phase. Um, as it turns out, fusion power generation is, is a pretty difficult uh, problem to crack. Um, so in terms of my challenges, yeah, I think my main challenge right now is that we're having to be a little bit more grown up, if I put it that way. Um, we've had a sudden growth spurt. So we've gone quickly from 30 to 40 to over 50 employees. Um, so more people means more concurrent technical projects, more experimental campaigns that are going on, more contracts that have to be sorted out, etc. cetera. Um, so Overall, for the IP function, there's much more work. Um, but at the same time, it's the same resource, uh, me. 
So, so to address this, I've been basically adding some more self-service support for the company. So, you know, online bite-sized training videos for people to watch when they have time, uh, NDA templates and, and instructions on how to go about that, some playbooks kind of thing, online service request forms and, and things like that. So individually, they're, they're just small improvements, but overall they can make a, a, a real difference. So that's my challenge right now, but there's always been different challenges, it seems. And uh, you know, I think, that's, again, that's pretty typical for a company as it grows and gets bigger. Uh, the, the challenges just keep coming and keep changing. Thank you very much for that, Martin. Um, that, that, I say, I think the, the, the contrast there with, with the challenges being faced by Tim, this sort of flags up to people that, uh, you know, th this whole business of protecting your IP can change dramatically over the, the course of the business development. And you only need something quite different to, to, to be there in terms of, you know, engaging more staff or different direction of your technology to, um, you know, say put the spanner in the works there but certainly make make life an awful lot more complicated well we we've had these pictures of, of the challenges the companies are facing guys set out very clearly resources from the ipo but what i really like to know is is take the perspective of you know one of our investment um colleagues here so i'm very delighted that the cassie's joined us here um uh, not just to give a perspective from the investment side of things, but also to redress the balance slightly from the tech side to the life sciences as well, because I know Cassie speaks from years, years of experience in, in that field. So as an experienced director in, in life sciences as well, Cassie, how crucial for you is IP when you assess, assess investment opportunity? And what are you actually looking for as an investment investor from the company or the research team in their IP strategy? Great. So thank you, Jeremy, for inviting me to be part of the panel today. And congratulations to IP Group and also to First Light on their anniversaries. Um, so obviously, part, um, at part what we invest in technology businesses that have risen out of UK university research. We invest at all different stages from seed companies all the way through to aim listed companies. And for all of these, IP is really critical. And it's critical because it means um, a sustainable barrier to entry for competition. So I think from a sort of an investment perspective, that's, that's really key. Um, if we think about it from the life sciences and picking up on some of the points that have been made before, I think what's, what's very relevant is there's different sorts of IP for different sorts of companies. So in the life sciences, you know, a bit like Tim was referring to earlier, digital health companies may have important IP that's protected by know-how um, and trade secrets. Whereas if you look at a drug discovery company, patents around um, core platform technology and whatever drugs, for example, could result out of that um, are other important aspects of the IP. So I think um, investors take that into account when they're looking at IP, but it is really, really essential in terms of when we look at a company from the original pitch all the way through the due diligence process. So as an investor, when I see a first pitch, I'm keen to kind of get the overarching understanding of what the IP is and what that means. Again, picking up on Jeremy's point in the first part of the session about explaining your IP to investors in a way that they can understand it and see where the value lies is really important. And then um, as we kind of dig deeper and deeper in, I think it's really important that we understand what the status is of all the different applications, whether they're granted, what territories they're in, what the key claims are within the patents. Now, personally, I might look at the claims, I probably wouldn't read the whole application, however exciting it might be to someone like Jeremy, but I would tend to sort of refer to expert counsel to kind of have a look at the IP in, in a lot of detail. Um, but we'd also look to see things like licensing agreements, any assignment agreements, which I think are especially important with university stage companies, and also um, freedom to operate. So again, this differs with different stages of company, but um, you know, would ask the question around any potential freedom to operate issues. So I think, you know, as an investor, look to dig into the details a bit and would expect a company to have kind of robust information about their patent and their patent strategy available. Um, this information will, will evolve over time and will be different over time. So an early spin out company, you know, there's likely to be some initial applications and, and some initial strategy, but that's going to evolve, you know, 
to particularly lar much larger portfolios um, in, in terms of first life fusion as an example as the, as the company grows. And I think the IP strategy sort of evolves over that time as well. But I think there's three kind of important component parts sort of picking up on your question on this, Jeremy. Um, the first one um, that I think is really important is that the IP strategy is really closely linked with the commercial plan and the product plan. And that can be articulated clearly to investors. Um, I think secondly, having um, internal stakeholders engaged, and as was pointed out earlier, really good um, external advisors engaged in that IP strategy is also fundamental. And then just going again to some of the other points that were raised earlier about the strategy should really have very good kind of internal habits and recommendations and culture about processes and how IP is managed and how disclosures are managed. And I think especially when teams transition from sort of universities and they grow, making sure that's embedded within the culture of the organisation is really important. That's brilliant. Thank you, Cassie, so much for that. I think you know, the, these are some you know, incredibly wise words here that you know, we, we're, we're starting to hear some, some real themes coming through this sort of time and time again as every, everybody speaks on, on, the, on this panel here. And I hope you know, everybody is taking this on board because these, these, these are the IP tips that you won't find in the textbooks. These are the IP tips that you won't even find on Wikipedia um, uh, unless I decide to write an article myself with co-authorship of the four panellists helping me out on this one. Um, keeping a weather eye as well out for please do feel free at this point to start diving in with your own questions and answers on this one we will all see those coming in but and, and until we will see one or two more of those come in keeping the conversation going here Guy mentioned earlier on some of the, the, the marvellous initiatives that are, are going on at, from the UK IPA and on their website um, one more that I maybe would put to our two um, portfolio company panelists here, Tim and Martin, is have you or you know, your team had any cause to interact with the UK IPO on this one? Are there things there that you know about now that you weren't aware of before that you might want to? Um, Martin? Uh, well, actually, to be honest, I don't think I've ever engaged directly with the IPO apart from with Guy for this chat, of course. Um, all official communication is normally done via our external patent attorneys. However, I do occasionally access the IPO website, and I certainly agree with Guy here that there are some really good short introductory videos, for example, and those videos are suitable for anyone, whether they're IP professionals or, or just uh, you know anybody, basically, for understanding. Um, I must say, most importantly to me, their blog that follows the BBC's uh, Dragon's Den TV programme, that I avidly read after every episode. And again, that, that does actually raise a couple of nice little tips um, for people. And I think that works really well. Um, and, and I've even sent around a link to that as part of my internal IP newsletter and finally lighthearted section at the end of that. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks very much indeed, Martin. Tim, your, your, your thoughts? Um, it was very Similar, actually. I mean, we've, we've, we uh, do all of our direct interactions, uh, again, with the UK IPS through our patent attorneys. Um, but, you know, my, my main uh, personal uh, engagement with, with the UK IPO has been as a source of information. I mean, it, it really is a fantastic resource that, that, that is there for, for everyone to access. Um, you know, if, if IP is part of your business, take some time and look and see, you know, what they can do to, to, to help you. Um, you know, even, even if it's just as, as a way of, of sort of increasing your, your own general knowledge or, or specialist knowledge, it can be really useful. Thanks, Tim. And I, and, I, and I would echo that myself. I think um, there are a few sort of themes in terms of the questions I get asked from um, yourself and colleagues with, within sort of the wider community of the, the IP group portfolio companies. But one that keeps on coming back and back is, is there something we can provide that's a bit of basic IP training and how we can manage our IP there? What resources are there? And I think these resources that um, first of all, the, the IPO that Guy has mentioned, the building up there and people just need to tap into and maybe engage with the IPO and say, well, look, these are all great, but can you provide something about X, Y and Z? And then looking at um, when you've got this more resource available, um, looking at what Martin's been doing within First Light Fusion to build up the, the in-house resource as well. I mean, trying to one of one of my um, actually one of my goals for this year, my objectives this year is, is to do this within IP group as well. But I think we're, we're all sitting on, on, on this fund of built up experience where we experience the more we can pass that wisdom on and I think 
point people in the right direction so really practical pragmatic advice and training rather than necessarily perhaps 101 it's got to be novel and inventive well i do um you know it's, it's got to be a lot more than that so that that's great to hear so whilst i've been waffling on there a couple of questions have popped up i knew this would happen so um, the first one that's come through from from uh, Russell Woolley at Cartmel's um, says, well, clearly an SME should be IP savvy. Um, however, do SMEs encounter issues with a, a lack of IP savviness from investors? Um, for example, during due diligence, would a negative written opinion on a, an early stage, say, PCT application need some explaining as being something that is part of the course and by no means terminal? So um, maybe, first of all, I might pass that one rather invidiously back to Cassie there. I mean, Cassie so is, is clearly um, not lacking in IP savviness at all on that point of view. But, you know, from working quite often, we, we, we work in you know, partnership with other investors to bring in a, a group investment bid to these things. Um, and have you perceived sort of a, a reluctance to engage with, with IP maybe from on a detailed level from, from other investors, Cassie? I think we, we work with a lot of specialist investors in um, and we work in syndicates a lot at Park Walk. And I think in general, um, investors are pretty savvy in terms of the, the IP. And me sort of, for, for example, I would look at a, a response to a PCT application. And I think always know that, you know, different citations will come up in this. But I would, you know, I would want a response as to why, you know, if there's a number of X citations, for example, why, you know, what's the company's strategy around this? So I think, um, I think investors understand that things aren't black and white at this stage, but what they want to see is a clear answer from the company as to how you're going to get around these particular issues. That's brilliant. Thanks very much for that one, Cassie. And I think looking at this whole idea of how you do actually sort of report back your, your IP then to the to the, the investors just to raise the issue of, of, of how you present this and so maybe again flicking this back briefly to 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 tim and mars on this one of how you um regularly present the progress of your ip at, at board level when when the, the review is going there uh, tim how, how would you be yeah, presenting this I'm absolutely uh, happy to, to to tip in um so again with with, with rfc you know we we keep tabs on all of our uh, patents that are, that are currently in, in prosecution and understand what the main objections are that have been raised by, by the various patent examiners are. Um, and you know, as we report to, to our investors on, on progress with, with these, these patent applications, we, we're clear um, what our strategy is going to be to overcome this objection, to be able to identify you know, where the, 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 the key bits of invention are, you know, how what we're doing is, is normal and, and, and why either you know, we feel confident that we'll be able to get the patent granted with claims as they are, or what our strategy is going to be for um, adjusting the claims in order to maximize the, the, the value for, for what we can get granted. Mars, did you have anything to, to add to that one? Um, you know, I would say that uh, for me, generally, when I'm presenting to the board, then I, I tend to keep it very simple and uh, pretty high level. So just the, the top highlights since the last board meeting that have happened, uh, any issues that have, have come up, and just a few KPIs, um, yeah. including any changes in, in, in the amount of IP assets um, over all, all forms. Um, but of course, there's more detail available if it's needed to back it up or if there are any questions. Um, and I, I think here, what I'm trying to do is basically give the board reassurance that everything is progressing well, as mm -hmm. expected, under control and is managed. Um, so, for example, from our KPIs uh, last year, it was clear that our invention disclosures started to dry up during mm -hmm. the first COVID lockdown last year. Um, so obviously this was raised to the board uh, as, uh, as this was happening and along with an action plan um, of how I was going to be, going to address it. And, and now we're back to normal levels again, including averaging over that period. So, you know, I think it's just down to, to COVID uh, uh, impact, yes, if you like. Yes, yeah. But it's, it's good to monitor and make sure you're on top of it and, and addressing such things. Um, again, for the investment rounds, uh, again, it's pretty much high level. Um, as Cassie has mentioned, um, but when it comes to actual to do diff, due diligence, as you've mentioned, you, they definitely go through everything with a fine tooth comb. Um, so you have to be ready for that extra detail and be able to go down to, to very low level. Yeah, 
as, as, as I've seen on, on that one too. I won't say to our, our course, but certainly as this has proved some challenging moments for me over the last few months on one or two there as well. Thanks, Martin. Briefly, I've, there's a few questions coming in. Just before I try and squeeze one of those slides, I'll circle back to, to Guy on this one. Um, you mentioned sort of right at the outset there, Guy, sort of some of these, these marvellous initiatives that are coming out of the, the UK IPO. Have you sensed a, a change in the way that the IPO seems to be engaging with SMEs as, as the whole environment around the chase importance changes from that point of view. Have you sensed any sort of feeling of a greater IP savviness for them, for example? I, I think um, so going back a little while, things like um, a patent box, so not actually a UK IPO um, initiative, um, one from Treasury, but but actually you know, we were involved, obviously. But, um, uh, but, but things like that, I think, have really kind of elevated intellectual property up people's agendas um, because there's there's other people in the ecosystem that now need to sort of understand it. Um, so I certainly I, I've seen that. And then obviously, as we've as we've left um, the European Union, there's, there's been some issues there, um, clearly. Uh, but we've seen increases actually um it seems in people's uh, strategies and portfolios so we've we've seen increase in trademark and design applications at the um at the office um patents seem to be holding about steady but um but you know and there are multiple reasons for that covid i think there's probably a covid factor in mm -hmm. some of that as well people being at home thinking about sort of um perhaps on furlough and thinking what, what you know what we're going to be doing when we um if, if we return or, or whatever so i think there's some interesting we are seeing some some changes in, in how people are approaching these things yeah, that, thanks and i think it's so it's, you sort of preempted all the other questions i had there had there been a, a brexit effect as well on that one guy i think if we've uh, webinars at the moment we, we we we've had the ability to reference references to covid and to brexit so I, I think sort of the um the need to work one into donald trump is probably not there at the moment anyway so i shall forego that one um, especially for sitting there in the audience now I'm conscious of the times so i just like to maybe squeeze there have been a lot of questions coming through and thank you everybody for them i'll try and if we can't at least sort of um, take them offline and get answers back to people here. But one that's come through from Anthony Coleman, and this one might be back to um, Cassie again, is how your view changes um, to, to the IP as the, the stage and progress of the company changes, whether it's sort of seed funding or whether, I mean, I, I know you sort of see this from the, the Park Walk Advisors perspective, like this was slightly earlier, but whether it's there, whether it's Series A or Series B, would you say the perspective on the IP and the value of it changes during the progress there, Cassie, or do you just simply always look at it in the same way? So I think it's it's important at all the different stages, um, but I think the the type of IP will change through that period. So at the beginning, it's more around sort of potential and initial application filings, for example, if it was patents, and then it's more around the granted portfolio as a as a company evolves over time. Um, and then I think also picking up on some of the points that that Martin mentioned earlier. I think as the company grows and the portfolio and the patents get bigger and more important, how is the company going to manage that? Are they going to have people internally? Um, you know, and how does that work with engaging with external advisors and stakeholders as well? Brilliant. That, that's marvellous. Thank you very much for that, Cassie. Well, we, we are sadly just about to be running out of time, conscious that everybody's probably got 15 zillion other Zoom calls to be diving diving off to on that one and questions to be coming in here. So what I might like to do to wrap things up before um, DB makes his closing comments on this one is to go around the panel very quickly and ask them each for their, their top tip. There's, there's one actually question that's, that's come in fine that might help frame that as well your top tip and, and do you see as any particular um, form of IP of being of, of more value than the others? Maybe slightly invidious question there to, to put, but quickly your, your top tip for, for SMPs and IP management, um, starting with, with Guy, please. Uh, yeah, I, 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 you know, all IP is equal for us. Um, uh, but I think, yeah, uh, practically keep your IP under review and uh, and perhaps structurally, you know, please keep an eye out for those consultations. And um, and and if you're prepared to sit on things like roundtables, we'd, we'd really welcome that. Brilliant. Thanks, Guy, Tim. Um, uh, you know, I'd agree. I think, you know, the, the top of type of IT, IP that's most valuable is really dependent on the type of business that you're in. Um, you know, my, I suppose my, my top tip would be to be proactive in the way that you manage your IP. Have regular reviews where you evaluate developments, encourage your team to write, write things down and reward invention. Brilliant. Cassie? So mine's really about investors. So um, making sure that you provide information on your IP to your potential new investors and current investors in a very clear manner and just make sure that it aligns very clearly with your product and commercial strategy. 
Was it perhaps guessing last, Martin? Uh, the, the joys of going last. I agree with the other panelists. Um, uh, for an SME, I think it's important to think about all forms of IP as early as possible and to formulate some kind of appropriate plan or strategy, whether it's registered rights, uh, such as trademarks or patents or unregistered rights like copyright, trade secret, et cetera. Um, I think the initial plan uh, for some forms of IP might actually be do very little or even nothing to protect it to begin with. Perhaps at an early stage, it's more important to get something out there or get some cust customers and products on board. Um, it just really depends. Um, so it might be a bit controversial, it might not be the right thing to do. So it might be the right thing to do, even though it might seem like it's not. Um, but the main point here is to have placeholders and start the culture recognizing the value of IP and then adapting that and changing it as needed as the organization, organization evolves and grows. Right, so I'm pleased here. This this whole idea of instilling this as a as a cultural thing really needs to be done, and right from the outset on that one. Well, sadly, um, we we've not managed to plow through the questions there. I, I have got them flashed up here, and I will do my best to get back to the folk who's sending them in. So thank you for all those questions that come in, and apologies that I've not been able to answer them all here. Um, my huge thanks to everybody on the panel here, to Cassie, to Guy, to Tim, and Martin for um, putting you know huge amounts of effort into this over the last couple of weeks. We pulled all this together and sharing those sort of frank and very experienced opinions on here, which I hope has been useful for everybody. And I think at this point, just before we go to 11 o'clock, I need to come back to DB to shut me up as well on that one. DB. I'm here. Well done, Jeremy. Great. Well done all. Thank you, uh, Kathy, Guy, Tim, Martin. Thank you all. It was really excellent. Very natural. Good to have real input from the real experts talking about what you know about so well. So thank you very much. A very enjoyable hour. Um, we will, as Jeremy says, draw to a close now. People have to go on to 11 o'clock. Uh, our next um, uh, webinar is going to be on Thursday, the 13th of May. So put it in your diary. It's going to be led by our deep tech team who will be looking at both some of the historic work we've done, but also future trends. They'll be looking at uh, quantum computing and AI, something to look forward to. And as a, as a point, it's uh, now up on our website. It's gone live while we're talking. So if you want to go through to our website, the web address will be coming up after this. You can click straight through and register for that event. Because of the quirks of GDPR, even if you've attended this, we can't always invite you direct unless you've got permission to do so. So feel free to uh, come through and register on the website. But so again, um, thank you. A lot of very late questions, Jeremy. Questions came pouring in at the end, didn't they? Um, so sorry we didn't answer them all. But thank you all for, um, for logging in. It's great to have you all here today. We look forward to seeing you at the next event. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye-bye.